are listening to Muslimish Freethinkers, a podcast dedicated to fostering conversations on matters of faith and disbelief. All right, let me switch the screen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, another episode of uh, Muslimish Freethinkers broadcast. Muslimish is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to create a safe, supportive, and open minded environment for the exchange of thoughts and ideas among current and former Muslims to foster a pluralistic society that respects the rights of all individuals to live according to their conscience and to abolish blasphemy and apostasy laws across the globe. Muslimish was established in 2013 in New York City and now functions in 12 chapters in North America. If you value our mission statement, we encourage you to become a Muslimish member as we rely on the generous support and volunteerism of our members and donors to sustain our programs. My name is Wissam Sharaf I joined Muslimish in 2012 and helped found it as an organization in 2013. I am currently a Muslimish board of directors uh, and I am a member in Muslimish Detroit. I will be your host today. Although I'm a software engineer by degree, I have extensive background in Islamic studies in addition to a strong academic interest in the theory of evolution. My study of the theory of evolution in the years 2008 and 2009 was part of a research I was conducting titled Islam and Evolution, and that led me to a life transformational understanding of science. Now, I'll ha now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Rana Dijani. Uh, Dr. Rana Dijani is a molecular cell biologist from University of Iowa, and she is a C. Malokova Fellow at the Jespin School of Leadership at the University of Richmond. She's a Harvard Radcliffe Fellow, a Fulbrighter, Eisenhower Fellow. She's a professor, former Center of Studies a Director at the Hashemite University in Jordan, and a visiting professor at Yale and Cambridge, ward expert on genetics of the Caucasian and Shechen populations in Jordan, established stem cell research ethics law in, jo in Jordan, advocate for biological evolution in Islam. She's a speaker at, the McGill, at McGill University and MIT, and Jordan team leader in studying refugee youth with Yale University and the epigenetics of trauma across generations. She's also a higher education reform expert, a member of UN Women Jordan Advisory Council, a writer in science and nature magazines, established a, a women mentor network, and received partnerships for enhanced engagement and research award 2014, organized the first gender summit for the Arab world in 2017, named one of the most influential women scientists in the Islamic world in 2012, and among 100 most influential Arab women in 2015, entered Women in Science Hall of Fame in 2015, and received King Hussein Cancer Institute for Cancer and Biotechnology Award 2009 and 2016. She also received the Global Changemaker Award for celebrating 70 years of the Fulbright program, and she is the president of the Society for Advancement of Science, Technology, and Innovation in the Arab World, named one of the women of influence in the Arab World in 2021 by Arabian Business Magazine. She's awarded a numerous awards, among which is the Jordan Star of Science by His Majesty King Abdullah II, awarded University of Iowa College of Medicine Distinguished Alumni Award in 2018, named Higher Education Reform Expert uh, EU Tempest Jordan. She is the founder of the Service Learning Center Hashemite University. She was a speaker at TEDx Detsi and TEDx uh, PSUT. You can watch them on YouTube. And she was a speaker at World Islamic Economic Forum 2012 and World Science Forum 2015 and 2017. She received the Clinton, uh, Clinton Global Initiative 2010. She received the Synergios Arab Awards uh, Social Innovators 2009, Library of Congress Best Practices 2013, World Innovation Summit and Education Award 2014, King Hussein Medal of Honor 2014, Star Award 2015, among, among other 
uh, uh, very important uh, awards and, distingu and dist uh, distinguishments. Uh, Dr. Rena, I am very impressed by also your uh, humbleness and your continuous uh, dedication to science. I almost uh, see you on an, every other day on an interview, and uh, you are uh, very selfless in providing your time uh, to uh, spread education of science and uh, empowerment of women and everything that is good in this world. So thank you very much. Th thank you for inviting me uh, uh, to be here today. And actually, I'm always um, excited to meet new people and to listen to new ideas and different perspectives. So I'm learning as well. <laughs> and it's my curiosity that gets the most of me. Uh, so please, uh, for those who are listening, uh, please write down your notes, your questions, your comments, your critiques. And, and if we don't, even if we don't have time today, email them to me and let's continue this conversation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Djani uh, is a very hard worker. She's also your, your inspiration in, in many uh, different ways, one of which is that although your financial circumstances prevented you from getting to Cambridge University in your youth, you eventually managed to get there as an associate professor. And you are not only a scientist who deals with theory, you're an educator and social influencer. You step up to every possible situation where you can help and benefit, no matter uh, who uh, inviting you, uh, who are inviting you, and how busy you are. Uh, this interview itself is a testimony of that. I thank you for making the process of setting it up so easy, and I thank you for your humbleness and selflessness in the service of science, education, and humanity. As I researched um, your, you know, your previous interviews and lectures in preparation for this, I was just amazed at the amount of uh, um, educating you have been doing uh, all over the world. Uh, sorry for the long introduction, but it is well deserved for you, doctor. So welcome again to Muslim Free Thinkers broadcast. Uh, before we get to the theory of evolution, I want to ask you about uh, the importance of doubt and questioning in the process of reaching uh, to the truth. Note that our Muslimish logo that inserts a big question mark to the crescent of Islam, making it the focal point and destination in itself, making questioning and skepticism and inquiry at the center of it. And as my understanding from your previous lectures is that you see the same in Islam. So can you start with that and then uh, can you talk to us about the theory of evolution and how can we simplify such a very complicated theory in science? How can we put it in simple simple words for those who are seeing this for the first time as a, as a way of educating themselves about the theory of evolution? <clears throat> Thank you for that question to kick off the talk, uh, actually. That's a, a really good, uh, very um, uh, a nice segue. I take, you know, in Islam, one of the fundamental uh, uh, characteristics is that we, Allah tells us that we have a brain and that we should celebrate it by using it, uh, by, by following our curiosity. And wherever our uh, questioning and our curiosity takes us to actually follow that until the end. And that's uh, wajib, that's obligatory on us to do that. And therefore, nobody should tell us you can't ask or you shouldn't question. And as evidence for that, uh, I like to quote uh, some verses from the Quran, from Surah Al-Baqarah, when Abraham, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, when Abraham asked Allah, uh, show me how you uh, bring the dead back uh, uh, back to life. So Allah didn't tell, and this is Abraham asking uh, Allah, right? Not me and you, we could have our doubts. This is Abraham, who shouldn't have doubts, asking Allah, who, of course, you're asking the, the creator. And Allah didn't tell him, no, you can't ask, or that's not allowed, or uh, or even reprimanded him. He actually explained to him to go and collect physical evidence on, on how to show him uh, that uh, the way that uh, Allah brings back uh, the dead uh, back to life. And to me, that's a testimonial on how we should pursue our lives in observing nature and, and asking questions and demanding uh, scientific evidence uh, to support any explanation or hypothesis we put forward to explain the natural phenomena around us. And so, therefore, to me, Islam is wonderful and amazing because it celebrates my brain, it, 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 um, it makes me ask questions, and it encourages me to follow my curiosity wherever it leads because 
What matters is your intention. And, and nobody can judge your intention except Allah. So ask whatever you want. And, and people can try to help in answering. But if they don't give you the answer that satisfies you, then this is our responsibility to keep on asking and pursuing uh, answers that satisfy us. And that's the journey of life. And that's the spice and zest of life. And that's why life is so wonderful and amazing. Because it's a journey that never ends. Because with every new human being that's born on this earth, that human being is unique and therefore will look at life in a whole different perspective and, and attempt to understand it and explain it and, and, and embark on that journey all over again. So in, in that spirit, uh, I'll, I'll start sharing a few slides to talk about evolution. Sure. Okay, so here we go. Share screen. You can share screen or you can share slides. And if uh, it's... I tried the slides didn't work, but I'll I'll do the share screen sure. and then we, we can go. Hopefully that will work. Oh. Chrome has lost permission to capture your screen. All right. I don't want to waste time. That's strange. Is it a PowerPoint uh, or a Google slide? It's a PowerPoint. Yeah. So you share your share and slides, and then you can upload your slides from your computer. Will make it easier for you. Oh, to, so uh, uh, so I I go to your computer, and uh, then you upload go to them? share and slides and your computer. Yes, and you and upload. upload the presentation. Slide. Uh -huh. All right. While you look for it, uh, while you prepare it, Doctor, I'm going to show a little clip about uh, uh, Doctor uh, Dijani speaking about um, her uh, view of uh, you know how she combines faith and uh, the theory of evolution. If you allow me, well, I believe that there is a God, and that he uh, started the, the everything in the beginning. And creator in that sense means that he put down the laws, the natural laws, whether they're the physical laws, gravity, relativity, quantum mechanics, or the natural laws in terms of biology, natural selection, and adaptability, uh, which also include that element of randomness. Uh, and then the universe set forth obeying those laws uh, and evolved and went forward. Uh, so to me, God is the creator in that sense. He does not interfere in every minute. He is outside of time. And therefore, this concept of before and happening now and later does not exist for him because he is beyond dimension. But it exists for us, and therefore sometimes we find a difficulty in, in um, asso associating a God creator with what's going on today. But in, in the way I see it, God the creator, in the sense that he created the laws, and then nature unfolds obeying those laws. For God, the concept of God intervening as life or the universe unfolds and progresses and evolves, uh, only exists uh, as a concept if we are trapped in time. But if we can imagine that God is outside the dimensions of time, uh, then he's never intervening in that sense, and he's always intervening as well, because he's outside of time. Uh, so within time, to me, he's not intervening because he's outside. So this was Dr. Dijani's uh, view of, uh, of of theism in 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 her sense. Uh, Professor, um, uh, it's too big to to upload. Yeah, so I'll just uh, explain uh, a little bit about what evolution mm -hmm. is, and then you can follow with all the questions, and we'll have a conversation. Okay, great. So briefly, I, I mean. As human beings who has a brain, we are asked to observe, and what, this is what we do naturally, by the way, is that we look around us and we observe nature around us. And this is part of what makes us human, and this is how we survived, by observation and, and asking questions. And, and so some of us ask even more deeper questions, and those are the people who become the scientists, right, who are not satisfied with a simple answer but want to know more. And, and scientists come from every religion and every background because, again, that's a human trait. Uh, and, and what happened is that scientists, just as Darwin and other scientists before him, made the observation that there are so many diverse forms of life around us, from simple forms uh, of single cells to plants to fungi to fish to the different animals we see around us to ourselves as organisms, living biological uh, organisms. And so uh, the question was, how did all these forms come to, uh, come to be? Uh, and evolution 
as a theory, uh, came as an explanation to explain the process, the mechanism by which all these diverse organisms came to be and are still changing and evolving according to that fundamental process or mechanism. Now, the process is called, the simple form of the process is the theory of evolution, and, it, and the simple form of it is natural selection. And the first person to really put it forth in this way that we know today was Charles Darwin back in the, in the 1800s. But before him, as any scientist, they, a scientist builds on the shoulders of other scientists before him. So there were rudimentary mm -hmm. theories that pointed to things similar to evolution way in the past, even as early as the seventh century, when Ajahev in his book al Hayawan wrote about uh, different forms of life, trying to understand and explain how they all came to be, and many others mm -hmm. after him, uh, which you can read about in different books and, and articles. But, but fast forwarding back to Darwin, so what Darwin showed in his theory of evolution or natural selection is that there are a number of uh, tenets. First, that if you take any population, and for this example, we could talk about a population of snails or a population of trees, all, olive trees, for example. There is slight variation between each member of that population, just like human beings. We're all humans, but we have slight variations amongst us. That slight variation comes because of the differences in our DNA, which uh, springs from uh, mutations that may become random because of the DNA copying itself, or from radiation in the environment. But we have variation that is based in our DNA. Now, if we are all living in the same environment, we're all living. However, if there's a change in the environment around us, say in, our, in the environment around the trees, for example, there's an increase in temperature or there's a reduction in the amount of rain. Some of those trees will not survive because they're too sensitive because of their DNA. But some members of this population of trees will survive, right? Because they're slightly different in their DNA. And because they survive the high temperature, for example, they will grow, they will reproduce, and they will produce seeds. These seeds carry that genetic a mutation or change or trait that allowed these trees to survive the, the increase in temperature. So it's transmitted to the next generation. But it's not a random transmission and it's not predictive, right? It already existed before the high temperature happened, but it was just naturally selected for. And so these trees eventually constitute the next generation, those who can survive high heat. So you're changing who are the members of this population. Now, next time after two generations, the environment changes again. And so maybe now it becomes uh, less water. And so the, the trees who have the mutation that allows them to survive less water are the ones that will grow and reproduce and have seeds, while those who don't have that trait will not survive. So eventually, over a long period of time, as the trees replicate generation after generation, the traits of, of the general members of the population will change uh, retrospectively as a result of which one was selected in that particular environment. So it's the environment that keeps on putting pressure to, to select for a particular trait in, in that particular member of the tree population. That is the theory of evolution. And now to take it uh, as an explanation for all living things, that life started from a single beginning, nobody in evolution talks about how that beginning started. Evolution explains what happened after the beginning. So it doesn't deal with who that who started the beginning. We as Muslims say it's Allah. Uh, somebody else says it's another kind of God or somebody calls it nature or power, whatever. But nobody, evolution does not talk about the beginning. Evolution talks about the process of after the beginning happened, how from one single cell, many, many different kinds of organisms came to be and were still evolving, meaning we're still changing because the environment around us is changing and therefore we will change accordingly. Of course, this is set on a scale of a, a, a humongous scale of time of, of millions and almost billions of years. Um, and, and that's why it was, uh, this is what allowed the, the extent of time is what allowed to have the diverse species uh, that we, that had existed in the past, that exist today, that may exist in the future. So this is the theory of evolution in a nutshell. Uh, and maybe the last thing I'm going to comment before I open it to questions is that, so as Muslims, again, uh, our mandate is Islam is a religion that tells us how to live our lives. 
uh, how to uh, uh, communicate and have relationships with our fellow human beings and the universe around us. Uh, so it gives us the moral and ethical guidelines, and it reminds us that we have a brain that we should use for the good of the people and to take care of Earth and the universe around us as a responsibility, not to abuse it. Uh, and so from that premise... Islam itself or, or the Quran itself is not a book of science where I'm going to find all the scientific theories. It's a book to, to encourage me to use my mind to make those discoveries. And that's an ongoing process because there's always going to be somebody thinking all the time. So if all the answers were there, then there would be no reason for life. So the answers are things we seek. And that's part of our journey. And that's part of why we live and the purpose of our life. And that's how I look at it. So I don't use Islam to explain nature, I use it to uh, create a framework of how I should think about nature. And to help me ethically to deal with the discoveries that I make, uh, to make uh, ethical uh, decisions on how to use the knowledge that I that we as scientists discover in making humans' <laughs> life better and the universe around us. Thank you, doctor. Uh, actually, in, in 2008, 2009, while I was doing my research, uh, on the theory of uh, evolution, uh, I found a clip uh, uh, for you. I think it was in, in Sharjah uh, speaking about this, and that actually helped me a lot because I was looking for a Muslim perspective or a, you know a Middle Eastern perspective from a credible scientist on the subject. So there's many people who are not credible <laughs> who speak on the subject, but uh, for a credible uh, someone who's credible on the subject and you conferring uh, that uh, the theory is pretty much uh, an, uh, uh, a theory that is uh, totally acceptable in science and uh, there is not much uh, doubt about it or questioning about it, um, about its its correctness is uh, was very uh, powerful to me. Let me just fix my... Uh, doctor, so um, I want to ask you first that the personal question, uh, you as a, a Muslim who you know, grew up in, in Jordan, for example, and uh, you went to uh, public uh, to schools in, in Jordan, um, how did you, um, you yourself, how did you get to understand the theory of evolution? And uh, was there like a, a, a reason or a, or a moment of enlightenment where you like understood it and you and you realized it, and did it have an influence on you? Thank you for asking that question. Um, actually, uh, I, I'm sure I'm like many, many Muslims. You know, you grow up as a Muslim, and because you grow up as a Muslim, sometimes you don't question um, uh, a lot of things. But you take them for granted, right? And it's only uh, when you when you start asking the questions. The most important thing is to have somebody around you to allow you to ask those questions. And, and to um, engage in a dialogue, uh, uh, to, to delve deep into those discussions. And at that point in my life, when I was a teenager, my father was the one who I asked all these questions, and we would engage in deep conversations, trying to understand uh, free will, uh, and how much of it that I decide, or Allah decides, and, and how, how does that make sense? So that, in that beginning um, helped me to realize that I can think on my own to come up with a, an answer to the questions that I have that may uh, that may that others may not ask or where I may not find the answers. So starting from that that discussion about free will, when I encountered evolution as I was studying biology later, uh, and trying to understand how does that fit into the world of Islam as I grew up knowing it, realizing that there was a a kind of a clash because we all grow up thinking that things uh, that Allah created things instantaneously. Uh, and then, and then reflecting on that, how does that make sense with uh, with the theory of evolution, which is already a proven theory, and with all the facts and evidence that we already know, and that can, you know, that's uh, anybody can read it in any biology book, looking at the evidence for evolution. And I think that grappling uh, took um, time, uh, trying to understand, trying to go through stages, until uh, I realized that I don't have to find an explanation to make them fit. That's the wrong approach. And again, this comes from science. When you keep trying to answer the same question in the same way and you keep hitting a wall, you need to take a step back and shift your perspective and shift how you think of things. So I took a step back and said, no, I don't want to push that they have to be compatible. 
they are two different frameworks that exist together in mm -hmm. harmony and not to, I have to push them to fit each other. Islam tells me how to conduct my life, tells me to use my brain. Evolution is an explanation for a phenomena that, that, that was, came because I'm a, a scientist and I'm using my brain to explain that phenomena. So they're, they're, they're totally exclusive and therefore, uh, therefore they complement each other and not one has to replace the other. And I, when I took that, suddenly everything became very clear and very easy and very simple. There was no more contradiction. And I could be a Muslim believing in Allah and the wonder and elegance of his creation, while at the same time pursuing my curiosity, asking questions and being that scientist to come up with explanations to explain the natural phenomena around me. Uh, so it was a gradual process. But once that framework became clear, then everything um, uh, clicked into place. And, and the reason I like to talk about this framework that, that I keep coming up with is that this is important, not just for evolution. Evolution is just an example of when we don't have the right framework, everything goes wrong. Uh, and so we need to take a step back and, and, and see this framework that comes from Islam. And I think my, my own, of course, this is me, my own uh, analysis, is that the Islamic scholars in the past understood that framework very well. And that's why they were able to make all those scientific discoveries while being Muslim. But when we lost view of this framework, uh, then we, we went back to, to the challenges between religion and science, which comes from other religions who don't have this beautiful separation of frameworks that complement each other rather than replacing each other. Mm -hmm. Do you have, do you recall a specific moment uh, in your career that you um, all of a sudden realized the theory of evolution or you understood it and you uh, accepted it? Um, I mean, it, 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 so the, the, the time where it was all a discussion was mm -hmm. when I was in my bachelor's or my undergrad, it was always a discussion. I wrote a thesis. I remember a short thesis trying to explain the compatibility, um, mm -hmm. but, but not to the degree of um, maturity uh, that I had later. Uh, now, I went and did my PhD in biology, where, which was pure science, and I wasn't thinking of any contradiction. But then when I came back to Jordan and this issue was brought up again, because when you're doing science purely, you're not thinking of, of, of any of this. But coming back to Jordan and, and people talking about this contradiction between Islam and evolution made me pause and reassess that old theory I had a long time ago and, and uh, um, uh, develop it further, that this is a framework that's totally separate. Uh, and that gives me that freedom to be who I am as a human being ethically, morally, but have the openness and freedom that comes from my religion to think outside the box. So it came later um, when I came back and became a professor at the university, uh, thinking it through and then writing it down uh, and going through different iterations. And, and these discussions are important because they help develop the, the different, uh, these, the iterations until I, uh, I think what, what, what I have today, what I've written about, and there's a book forthcoming about the issue uh, explaining this framework in more detail. And the reason I, like I said, I, I don't like to discuss evolution to create a controversy. Um, I'm a scientist, I'm not an Islamic theologian, uh, but I talk about my personal beliefs and how I look at the, uh, at the issue. Uh, and, and this framework, I think, can be used as a stencil for other issues where we, it appears we have a conflict when really we don't. We have a beautiful religion that calls us to, to use our brain and to be very open. And, and, and that's the fundamental thing that we need to hold on to and let ourselves free uh, to, to discover the world. Yeah, and it's amazing that uh, you, you've mentioned uh, previously that uh, th that historically we have not developed uh, resistance to the theory of evolution. Actually, uh, many of the Muslim scholars have uh, said things uh, um, that is in the in the flow of what became later the theory of uh, of evolution, and there was no controversy uh, in their time by by saying that. I will play this uh, uh, this clip about uh, Dr. Dijani uh, um, explaining her view that Quran is not a book of science. I think that the notion that uh, Quran is a book of science is, is a modern notion. Actually, it has developed in the previous seventy years. It's not uh, does not have a long history in Islam. 
uh, the Islam was never presented, Quran was never presented as a book of science. Uh, and that I, I feel that it has created so much pressure and created that created that conflict and sometimes confrontation between Islam and science that is totally uh, unnecessary and actually it put so much pressure on the Quran that made uh, that made it uh, also um, uh, uh, to to its disadvantage more than uh, to its advantage. Uh, I will actually not show this clip and saving time because you already mentioned uh, uh, the the concept, doctor. Uh, but I will go to a question by uh, John, uh, who has um, a question he's going to be asking live. And thank you, John, for joining us. Uh, I think you're muted. Fixed. There we go. Dr. Jujani, thank you so much for taking some time today to help us learn. I had a question. I was thinking about this. I was raised Catholic. So um, so that's, you know, the, the background that I have for, for a lot of these questions. And I was wondering, looking at this historically, I know that as soon as Darwin's Origin of Species book was published in 1860, there was immediate um, pushback from the church. They had book burnings and the Christian churches had a big problem um, right away. And I was wondering if that was the case with the Islamic world. Was there uh, an immediate concern or was it something that developed later as the Christian churches um, put together books and seminars and evolution denial programs like that. Um, things like the material from um, Adnan Akhtar and things like that. Is that a newer development or has this been going on all the time as it has been in Christianity? Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a really, really important to highlight because it helps us trace where this came from, this apparent uh, contradiction. So actually, uh, as I, as was mentioned earlier, uh, throughout is, the um, Islamic uh, history, civilization history, and I like to say Islamic civilization because within it, there were scientists from every religion. There were Christian scientists, there were Jewish scientists, and there were Muslim scientists. And what mattered mm -hmm. is that we all had this freedom under the Islamic civilization, under that framework that I mentioned, of, of freedom of thought and questioning and, and, um, and curiosity. And within those mm -hmm. over uh, 1,400 years, there were scientists who started talking about uh, rudimentary theories that were similar to evolution. And they're all outlined in, in, in many books now today. These are coming to light and people are documenting them and translating them uh, from Arabic into, into English. So the theory, nobody challenged those scholars in the past from the 7th century onward um, that this contradicts religion. It was just taken, you know, you're a scientist, you explore science, you come up with explanations and that's fine. Now, when Darwin uh, came with his origin of the species, which kind of really where the, the theory was mature and, and, and um, well, let's say, documented and written with evidence, um, it, it, the, of course, for the Christian uh, religion, and again, I'm not the authority on Christianity, I'm just quoting what's written in the textbooks, and you just said it yourself, that there was a huge opposition because to them, this contradicted the Bible. Uh, literally, because it was taken literally in terms of time and how old the earth is, etc. And so to them, if this contradicts the Bible, then it contradicts uh, the pre God who created the Bible. Uh, and, and so that was uh, um, that made uh, Darwin an atheist, right? Because if he believed in this, then he didn't believe in the Bible, then he didn't believe in God who created the Bible. Now, in Islam, it was a different uh, situation. Uh, the first, first of all, it took time for Darwin's book to be translated into Arabic, and it wasn't translated till late, uh, sorry, early in the 20th century. But before that, bits and pieces of it, of his, of Darwin's work, reached the Islamic world, the Arab-speaking Islamic world, and there were so, uh, scholars like Al Jisr who lived in Lebanon in the late um, 19th century, who read uh, uh, Darwin's theory and uh, wrote a whole trustees commenting on it without uh, taking it as an, something that's wrong or against Islam or against even athe uh, like an atheistic. To him, it was another explanation of nature and he took it into stride. So there was no opposition at all uh, 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 from the Islamic world. Now, also one has to take into note that during the late 19th century, early 20th century, the Islamic world was on the decline. Uh, both from an education point of view, from a scientific point of view, we were at the end of a civilization, as any civilization goes up and down, and we were at the end of it. So we didn't have enough scientists either, by the way, right? Uh, uh, and and therefore, uh, 
Islamic scholars, other than al Jisr, who was a prominent scholar and, and took the position, there were others who were not so educated as al Jisr. And what they heard is that the Christians were against Darwin. And the Christians were, were claiming Darwin was an atheist, right? And so if Muslims didn't have any knowledge to rely on from their own scientists, and they said, if, and this is my explanation, that if the Christians are the people of the book like us, and if they say Darwin is an atheist, then they're probably right, and we share that same concept about the book, then he's probably an atheist. And not only that, Darwin was used by colonial powers um, to, to verify uh, colonizing imperialism and, and taking advantage of, peop of social uh, evolution, that some were better than others, which is not what Darwin talked about at all. He was taken out of context and used and misused. Uh, and so that added to, that fueled more of the opposition towards Darwin. Oh, so he's the reason, you know, we're being colonized and all that. So a combination of those, uh, and there are many stories where even, the, you know, at American University of Beirut today, was a missionary school back in 19th, 19th century. And they had invited a scientist from the US who gave a talk about, which was uh, supportive of Darwin. He was immediately uh, kicked out of, the, uh, of that university and went back because it was against uh, Christian. At the same time when Al-Jisr was supporting Darwin and Al-Jisr was the Muslim. So in Islam, there was never a problem. It was with ignorance of science uh, in the Islamic world, that they relied on the Christian uh, viewpoint and adopted it. And that's when the problems happened. Uh, this was not a problem with Islam, it was a problem with Christianity, but we adopted it and, and then took advantage of it. Now, the reason it wasn't fixed is because now we're taking time for uh, scientists who are Muslim to come back, and that's slowly increasing. But if we allow questioning of religious scholars who had been against Darwin, uh, there's a political um, uh, a political aspect here, a political dimension, because if, if we are going to allow people to question the Islamic scholars about their position, this will not stop at just questioning Islamic scholars. It's going to go on to question politics and leaders. And so also there are people who have a political agenda that want, want don't want people to keep asking questions. And if evolution, evolution is the price, so what? Who cares, right? And so all these factors together added to, to, uh, to, uh, to this apparent contradiction between Islam and evolution, uh, which unfortunately has spread and has become uh, uh, something that people think is true when it really is not true. It's a myth. Uh, and, uh, and, we, and that's why I talk about evolution. N not that I want to highlight it or create a conflict because, you know, whether we agree or not agree, we're using the fruits of evolution by taking a vaccine, by taking drugs uh, to survive uh, and, and to alleviate uh, disease and prevent it. But I bring it up because I want people to be aware uh, that there are many contradictions, not just evolution and other issues in life that was never part of Islam, that we borrowed and took over from other religions and other cultures, thinking it was our problem when it really wasn't. And it came from ignorance and not understanding the framework uh, that Islam came with 1,400 years ago to free our minds, to question and never to be controlled by anybody except who we are and our intentions. Thank you, John, for your question. And please stay with us in the studio if you have any more <laughs> comments or questions. Uh, this is on evolution and colonialism by Dr. Dijani. And please use this couple of minutes, Dr. Dijani, if you want to take any sip of water. I'm a biologist, and as a biologist, I, I make observations around me to try to understand what are the natural laws that govern how different organisms have evolved uh, in the past and now and in the future. Uh, so using my logic, the laws of evolution, natural selection, uh, seem to make the most sense to explain these phenomena. As a Muslim, uh, looking back at the uh, Islamic civilization, which was actually uh, very important in the development of the different fields of science, medicine, physics, and biology, we see uh, in many uh, scholars' writings as early as 8th century, uh, scholars who have pointed to uh, different um, mechanisms governing evolution of different species. Rudimentary concepts that may look similar to Darwin's natural selection, but still the concept that one organism could evolve from ancient ancestors was present in the scholarly works. And this was never, ever a point of contention 
between religion, as is in, in, in this example, Islam, and, and science. And these scholars actually evolved. And so we have 8th century Jahil, we have 10th century Ikhwan al Safa, we even have al Raziyas uh, in the 12th century. And all these scholars pointed to different um, concepts that are similar to evolution. And there was never a contention. Uh, and then Darwin came along, uh, and the, the, um, the, appear, appear, no, the apparent contradiction between Islam as a religion and science as a concept only appeared in the uh, early 20th century. And this came because the, there's multiple reasons, but one of the most important reasons is, uh, first, it was the demise uh, of the Islamic civilization, so people were less educated and there was a lot of ignorance. But more importantly, uh, colonialism was rampant. And with colonialism, people used Darwin and social Darwinism as an excuse for colonizing and racism and imperialism. And so in the psychology of the people who were colonized, there was an association between Darwin and colonizing and oppression and, and with ignorance and not having enough scientists in the 20th century in the Islamic world, um, there became this kind of like um, contention between uh, evolution and Islam. Although in our history it never existed. And now today this is being reclaimed uh, and reinterpreted and redefined to remove that contention that only came temporary. Uh, another uh, very important point is also terminology. Uh, because many of the studies that were done to try to understand the concept of creator and evolution came from the Western world. And so the word creator in a Western context has a different meaning than it does in the Islamic context. In Islam, when we say God is the creator, it means that he created the laws and the, and the rules and they started unfolding later. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everything was done spontaneously. So when you ask a Muslim, do you believe in creation or creator, they will say yes, because they're talking about a God who started everything. But in a Western context, if you ask, uh, do you believe in God as a creator, it assumes that he is intervening at every minute, creating something spontaneously. So I think that also terminology and how we define creator across cultures and languages sometimes plays a role in, in uh, misunderstanding. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Um, doctor, you've attended a few conferences uh, for the Islamic World Forum and other conferences that uh, among Muslim scholars. Uh, and you've mentioned in, in another interview that uh, there were some scholars that you know were um, accepting of the theory of evolution some were uh, more resistant. Uh, I want you to speak a little bit about, about your struggle within such environments, trying to convey the opinion of science to Muslim scholars. What are the obstacles that you usually face? And do you, you, do you face less obstacles than you expect? Do you feel it is actually promising? And uh, in contrast, for example, to um, um, the Catholic Church, for example, who have a very strong science department. As you know, uh, a lot of uh, science uh, research has come from the Catholic Church and a lot of Nobel Prizes. Um, and in 2008, they have deemed uh, the theory of evolution as compatible with the Bible, although they did not offer uh, Darwin an apology, but, uh, but they accepted officially the theory of evolution. Do you think that we are get we will get to a point in Islam where uh, they accept officially like Al-Azhar or uh, other uh, Islamic authorities will accept the theory of evolution? Um, <clears throat> for, I do not agree uh, to the way uh, we are comparing Christianity and Islam because there's a fundamental difference on uh, between Christianity and Islam is that in Islam there's no pope. There is no one authority. Even Al-Azhar, it's not an authority for the whole for any Muslim, by the way. They produce a uh, they produce a verdict, but nobody's compelled to follow it. And that's the beauty of Islam. It is between you and and your God. Every, you can ask opinions, you can get knowledge and resources, but ultimately it's between you and God, and and you will only be judged by your intention. And nobody is allowed to judge your intention except Allah. Those two tenets allow freedom and license for every for for every human being and not to allow anybody to control you therefore uh, uh, requesting that uh, an islamic body to uh, uh, to sanction evolution is not how islam works 
Because if you give that authority to someone, it'll be used for other things later. And, and that's not what we want to do, right? Again, Islam is a framework. Go think and do whatever you want. You don't need a sanction. Uh, and therefore, I do not want a sanction from anyone. I just want us to work on freedom of thinking. And that's it. And that's and true. At a, sorry, but that's true at a personal level. But at the end of the day, there are Islamic institutions that uh, kind of represent a scholarly opinion. Yes, Muslims are not obligated by it. Uh, but it's influential on Muslims, the least we can say, right? Yes, but I, again, the way we present it, we have to be careful because by giving it the authority in the way you propose the question, you're giving it an authority that it does not, cannot claim um, in Islam. Now, uh, changing the general opinion, right? By, by uh, explaining what evolution is and what is the stand of Islam, again, in how I deal with this, to answer your question uh, in the way I would like to answer it, is that I engage with anyone who's interested to engage with me to ask a scientific question about evolution. And I'm ready to explain it. And I'm ready to listen to anybody who has an opposing opinion and to understand and listen to the line of logic behind it. So I do not refuse. That's my policy. And again, I draw that from Islam. Islam celebrates multiple opinions and it, and it celebrates diversity, which is fundamental to evolution, right? To have a diverse opinion. And, and I celebrate it as well. So I listen. I'm never aggressive and I say, I don't want to listen. I listen. But I ask for evidence, right? Again, I invoke religion and I want evidence for this line of logic. And I, and I respectively disagree when somebody tries to explain a logic that does not make sense to me. OK, and and then I say I respectfully disagree, but then I say if I do not uh, agree with what you're saying as an explanation for the diversity of species and I'm satisfied with my explanation. However, you, on the other hand, whoever that other side is, if you do not you're not satisfied with natural selection and evolution to explain the phenomena. Right. Then let's explore other ways. And if you think Darwin's explanation is not enough, it's not enough for you to reject it. You have to do the homework. You have to do your work to come up with a, a solution that explains it. So by that way, I, I open the door rather than closing the door. And I say, let go explore, go think. But you have to be a scientist. You can't explore just by reading a book. You can't explore trying to explain this natural phenomena of, of nature, of this diversity, these different organisms without studying them. Meaning you, you can't do it just by being an Islamic scholar. You have to go and become a scientist and do your homework. So you can't just say, I don't like it. You have to do your work. And that's where, uh, that's, a, that's an invitation for people to go beyond. And again, this is Islam again. I invoke Islam. Islam says you can't just talk, talk without evidence. You can't talk without doing the work. And, and, and then I offer a way to do this, right? And what I offer is that for those where they, they feel there's a contradiction and they can't find that compatibility, let's sit together and have discussions to try to understand these phenomena. And these discussions can't be one-sided. Again, it has to be uh, every, bringing in everyone who is an expert in the field to explain the field to each other. Today, no one will know everything. I myself, I don't understand Islamic theology to become an expert. I can talk only about evolution and biology. But I will sit with the Islamic uh, theologian and explain to him the biology. And I'll, I'll ask him to explain to me his point of view or her point of view. And then we sit together to find a solution together. Uh, and, and this is how we should go forward rather than taking opposite sides um, and, and just for the uh, uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's why I do not go into debates because I feel there's no reason for it. You only go into a discussion if you're willing to listen to the other side. Right. And I add to this, uh, as a scientist, when we uh, and for anybody who uh, uh, comes upon a topic that they feel that there's a contradiction, first of all, to remember that science is changing all the time, right? Because we 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 learn we get new tools, we, we think of new ways of thinking. So science is always evolving and changing. And therefore, today, natural selection is the best expl explanation we have for the diversity of organisms. But as scientists, we're always skeptical. We're always doubtful. But we use the scientific method in our brain to keep on questioning and digging deeper. Okay?
So we keep that in mind. Now, as tools advance, we're ready, we're open to listen, to think, to find other explanations. And we also need to remember also and be humble. Sometimes we're very, humans are arrogant and Islam reminds us not to be arrogant, right? Or it always reminds humans, especially, not to be arrogant, uh, is that we are also limited by our biology in comprehending um, uh, the world around us. B because our brains, we live in a three-dimensional world with time as a fourth dimension. But we know from theory in physics that there are actually 11 dimensions. Can we experience them? We can't. We know we can prove them on paper. In, 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 in proofs and calculations, but we can't experience them. And therefore, also acknowledging our limitations within our, our comprehension is very important. And, uh, and the last thing I'm going to talk about this is, and that's why we need to keep on engaging, talking to each other, explaining the different aspects and, and, and uh, knowledge from different fields, and for this to be a continuous conversation. And there's no final pr pr uh, uh, verdict. We keep on engaging and talking because, again, it's back to that journey of questioning and asking going mm -hmm. forward. So the, the title of this program, The Final Verdict, you oppose the title itself. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you will oppose it because after I listened to your lectures, I knew that this is not your style of having any final verdict. And scientifically speaking, we're always in a path of skepticism. There is never a final verdict in, uh, uh, <clears throat> in science. Uh, unfortunately, actually, uh, do you mind? I just want to add one thing. Sure. There's no final verdict either in the explanation of the Quran, because the Quran is explained by humans, and I, just like science, humans are every new human can see something different. The environment is changing, and the way uh, people interpret it will change depending on the environment. And we may uh, have a uh, explanation, uh, and humans can err. Mm -hmm. But we learn and we're humble and we keep on learning from each other. And that's the beauty of Islam, which is ishtihad and qiyas, to keep to adapt, to make sure that Islam is for every time and place. Because of that beautiful, unique diversity and openness mm -hmm. and, and trust in, 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 the, in how we think and in each other. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Wafa uh, Sawalmi, <clears throat> you said there's an echo. Is there an echo in my voice, uh, Doctor? Is it uh, clear? No, I, I heard an echo for mine a little bit. Okay. Uh, Suhan, is the voice uh, good? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, Wafa, it seems from your, uh, from your end, so please uh, try to just uh, refresh your page. Uh, we have a question from Hassan Daher. He says, uh, greetings. I believe in evolution and I am an atheist. I want to say that it's an arrogant thing to say that evolution isn't true while you forget about the DNA relations. What do you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, evolution explains how we came to be, explains the process. And the fact that we've discovered DNA as our genetic material and the similarity between all species in the past and in the future and now, that we're, we all have the same DNA, the difference between one species and another is 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 small, and there's so much uh, redundancy and so much conservation, and the different genes and proteins and enzymes that we share with other species, that speaks to evolution as an elegant, beautiful explanation of how all these species came about. Of course, is a testimony, um, and a, people who deny that uh, just don't understand the biology. They, they haven't done their homework, right? Uh, they haven't studied the biology. And that's why we should never, even in Islam, it says, don't talk about something unless you've done your homework. Go check, go check your resources. Go make sure you've said everything right before you come and say something. And that's fundamentally on how we should do it. So, yes. And today with the internet, we should we should have enough resources to make really an educated guess about uh, about this, and and moving to the, towards the subject of uh, education about about evolution, uh, doctor. Um, first, we're going to talk about <clears throat> what's the you know, because the theory of evolution is not a simple theory. I'm, I'm an engineer in training. I didn't get much uh, uh, biology in my in my career, so when it came time for me to learn about uh, evolution, it took me about a good six to eight months of continuous reading and and and, and studying. And the proximity of uh, the University of Michigan and other universities here allowed me to go and and ask the questions whenever um, I had any. And the, the presence of the natural history 
museums and the the the, the YouTube movement. <clears throat> so it it is really a little bit of work. It is not as simple as I feel uh, the the. Uh, I know that uh, creationism is not necessarily op opposing. Uh, evolution in our Islamic perspective, creationism is not necessarily opposing of the theory of evolution, but creationism in its Western sense, it's the opposite of the theory of evolution. And creationism is very easy to ex to understand. It's basically there is a, a supreme being who designs things, and that's easy to understand. But the theory of evolution it takes a little bit. Uh, as you said, we have not been we have not evolved to understand it. So it's kind of a a little bit of a, of an effort. So Nada Hassan asks, <clears throat> do you have any suggestions on how to introduce evolution to Muslim children without it causing confusion to them? Um, so it, it shouldn't cause confusion unless you are the one who is confused as you because so you 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 make you you uh, you make project. them feel you're right yeah you project if you are confused they're going to feel it and so you've projected your confusion on them. So the first thing is for you to work on yourself, to, to do your homework, understand what evolution is all about. And then suddenly, oh, everything clicks and this is amazing. So it has nothing to do with religion. Uh, when you sit with the kids and you talk about, you know, the beautiful diversity of species, how everything is made of DNA and how this DNA is the same from bacteria to, to humans and how we are, are cousins with apes and that we all come back to one ancient, ancient ancestor and we all came out of it. And like, isn't that wonderful that we are part we are part of this beautiful world. We are part of this biology. And this is so humbling, right? And that each organism is, is, has evolved to be the most fit for its environment. I can't live in a temperature of 100 degrees, but a bacteria, a thermophilic bacteria can. And it does an amazing job. And it has all those proteins and enzymes to make it live there. And I'm in awe, right? Um, I evolved to do something else, and I'm good at it. Horses have evolved to do a, a different thing. And it's this beauty, this elegance, uh, that 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 is what evolution is all about. So to me, that that does not contradict. And there's nothing to be confused about. So children are always uh, ready to listen and to understand and explain and be awe. We are the ones who project that confusion or that there's something wrong, and then uh, plants those seeds and doubts in them, right? And if a child asks you a question and you don't know how to answer it, you say, "Let's walk this walk together. Let's go explore together." You know what? I don't know either. And to have that also humbleness of saying, I don't know. And let's go read together. Let's go learn together and, and make these amazing discoveries. Uh, Professor Weil, 97% of the scientific community accepts evolution as the dominant scientific theory of biological diversity, according to Pew Research. <clears throat> there, is, <clears throat> excuse me. there is a public perception of science that is kind of uh, la lagging behind uh, these uh, numbers. So uh, in terms of acceptance of the theory of evolution, we find that 79%, uh, it is high in some countries like Kazakhstan and Lebanon, while it's very low in countries like Iraq, it's 27%, Afghanistan, it's like 26%. Um, the, in, in terms of teaching evolution, in the Islamic world, and that's an area of your expertise and your concern. Um, is there, <clears throat> is is that where the theory of evolution is being betrayed, sort of, by uh, not being taught properly or being dismissed due to religious sensitivities? I'm going to show you a little clip before you answer this question about uh, uh, a visit to a, a religious school in London by uh, Professor Richard Dawkins. <laughs> In our school, when our teachers tell us um, stuff like um, teacher stuff, it's like whether it's up to us whether we believe it or not. Um, the teachers do not disrespect our decision. It's everybody has a right to their own decision at the end of the day. Yes. Suppose we take a fact like, are we and chimpanzees cousins? I mean, do, do you believe that we're cousins of chimpanzees? Mm -hmm. Or monkeys? I, no, no. I wouldn't no. think so. What do your, so perhaps we have a science teacher, yeah. have we? What, 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 what do you teach about, about that? Well, yeah, we learn about in the curriculum because that's what we follow. Um, we teach them the theory of evolution. But then I do tell them we, in Islam, our opinion about it. And the girls also have their own opinion and ask questions. So, Miss, do we really come from chimpanzees? But um, they all have their own opinions for that and then come to their own decision, which every single one of them realize that actually we didn't because we believe differently. Every single one of them comes to the conclusion that we 
did not evolve. Yeah. Every, everybody in your science class, everybody in the school, comes to that conclusion. Well, in my class, yes, they did. And, uh, that how, how many is that? I mean... Uh, class, well, I teach 60 year 10 students, so right. 60 of them. And all 60 of them end up rejecting evolution. Yes, because obviously they have their beliefs, which is Islam. Yeah, about evolution. Um, um, it, um, evolution is that um, human evolved from apes and stuff. But if there are still apes here, then how did human evolve from apes? This, this is the commonest question I ever get. What, what, what's the answer of your science teacher to that? But I wanted to point the question to you because I wanted to know your opinion. Well, I, I'm, going, I'm going to give you my, uh, the answer, but we've been told that your science teacher teaches the theory of evolution. I'm interested okay. to know. That's exactly what we teach them, that um, humans evolved from apes. Yeah. And through natural selection, we became humans. And her question is, why are there still apes? Mm. Um. Well, I'll tell you why there are still apes. F firstly, we, we, are, we are not just evolved from apes, we are apes. Um, and when animals evolve from other animals, it's not that they, um, that they supersede them. It's not that we've evolved from chimpanzees. Chimpanzees and we have evolved from a, a shared ancestor who lived about six million years ago and who was neither a human nor a chimpanzee. The Professor, you teach uh, in your classroom, you say that the students, they start uh, with uh, some hostility to the idea and by the end of the, uh, cla you know, the, the class, the majority usually accept it, uh, although you know, sometimes it is, uh, they have challenges with the human aspect uh, of evolution. So what's your comment on that? Um, well, first of all, and I want to comment on this whole section that you put for, for Dawkins. Actually, um, again, as educators, what is the premise that we go and talk to people? Is it because we want to educate them or do we want to showcase a controversy? And I think that's a very fundamental question as educators, how we approach things. At heart, as an educator, we should always be looking how to help people understand more rather than to highlight a mis, uh, uh, ignorance. And, and I think, and, 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 and uh, so that's why my first comment. My second comment is all the data you shared about um, lack of uh, acceptance, although, I mean, it's not about accepting, it's a fact. You don't, I mean, you don't accept facts, they're facts. Um, however, the, that data is drawn on research, on surveys that used words and terminology um, that are not explained within the cultural context of what creationism means and what creator means. And so though that 27% and 36% and all those uh, do not necessarily reflect the real uh, picture on the ground. So again, I have, uh, I have issues with that. Lastly, uh, the reason, and we've done our own research, which we're publishing now, uh, that why do teachers do not uh, teach evolution, or if they do, uh, they don't do it in the right th way, as you saw from the example in the video, is because of lack of ignorance. They don't know what to say, uh, and they're ignorant. So it's not that they are against it after understanding it. It's a lack of understanding. And I think it's important to tease open what the problem is so that one can look for solutions rather than just highlighting problems. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a problem solver. Uh, and, and I like to look for solutions and how to go forward. Uh, lastly, uh, what I want to say is uh, jump that be, as a result of the data that you shared and these uh, simplistic questions, rather than digging deep to understand what the core of the problem is, results in jumping to conclusions and, and giving blanket statements about evolution in the Islamic world or accepting of evolution in the Islamic world that doesn't really dig to the complexity. Uh, and again, I urge you to look at the research that's gonna come out soon, uh, published showing that the teachers in Jordan, that the most of the, the reason, times that the reason they do not teach evolution is because they don't really understand it, not because of religion. So when you don't understand something, you kind of shy away from it. And it was obvious from the way they were saying that um, we come from apes when that is not the case. We and apes are cousins. And again, that uh, speaks to a, a, a challenge with arrogance of, of humans more than anything else <laughs> about what's the problem with being a cousin with, with an ape, right? Uh, we, we are all part of God's creation. And again, when I say God's creation, I'm saying it in an Islamic context, not a Christian Western context. And so when I say it, 
somebody could tick me off as somebody who does not believe in evolution. When I'm saying it uh, with all um, understanding of the process of evolution, when I say God created it, I meant he was the beginning, put all the laws, and then the laws unfolded and went forward. And I think when you explain it that way, people will understand it and accept it. Uh, because they understand that does not have any contradiction with with uh, having um, a creator, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, that that clip was part of a documentary that was trying to uh, you know focus on its theme, uh, which was not education; it was something else. But uh, Richard Dawkins Foundation in the United States and Europe have established an organization that helps teachers teach the theory of evolution by providing them resources. And I'm gonna leave the uh, link in the uh, in the comments for for you know it's, it can be used by any teacher uh, anywhere in the world uh, really. Uh, so, um, uh, Professor, uh, as we come to an end of our time, uh, first of all, I want to bring uh, uh, Sohan. Uh, Sohan, are you ready? <clears throat> he will ask. He has a, a couple of questions. Uh, hi, Dr. Dajani. Uh, pleased to meet you, and thank you for your talk. Um, I have a couple of questions with uh, slightly theological dimensions, but as I understand, you have reconciled uh, Islam, Islam and your understanding of evolution. So I'm curious about your thoughts about these concerns. Um, so in the timeline of hominin evolution, you know, Australopithecines and Habilis Ariaster, Neanderthals, humans, uh, when in this timeline do you believe that free will and souls like insanification, so to speak, uh, souls that could be judged by God would appear. Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, as a, as a, as a Muslim, I use my brain to answer these questions, right? Mm -hmm. So using my brain as a scientist to answer that question, first, I need to understand what does a soul mean? I need to understand what does free will mean? If you ask me now, do you want to drink water? And I say, yes, I'm going to actually, uh, consciously take a glass of water. Do I understand as a scientist what's going on in my brain? We still don't understand what's happening in our brains yet. The brain is a very complicated, sophisticated organ. And science is trying to understand it and unpack the complexity of the millions upon millions of cells and the billions of connections between them that ultimately forms my action. Uh, of making a decision whether I want to drink water or not, or whether I want to dream, or I, ha I have a, a, an intention to, to do something abstractly. We're still touching the surface. Uh -huh. So yeah. I, I do not, I cannot, and I don't have the answer to your question now, but your question encourages me to do more research, to try to understand what that means. And once I understand at some point in the future, me and others, what that means, then we can trace it back. To answer your question, when did this arise? What was that, um, whether it was a, a number of cells, was it a number of connections, what happened, what came up? And actually we try, we, it, it, this is something that we can, uh, uh, again, it's an it's a, uh, encouragement and a call to do more scientific research and understand it. So I have another question. Yes. Yeah, I have a, another question, which is a little bit related perhaps. Um, so, if evolution by natural selection, since it has happened, it can arguably continue to happen and can possibly happen anywhere else. Well, abiogenesis aside, anywhere else where life has emerged in the in the universe. So uh, that raises the possibility of the potential evolution of non-human rational life forms um, from either human or non-human lineages, like for example, um, you know, maybe maybe humans will go extinct, and somewhere from the human from from the um, the current human or non-human lineage, other sentient rational life forms could exist, and maybe even elsewhere in the universe where um, life has emerged. You know, abiogenesis has happened, and evolution of rational life forms can exist. So I'm just wondering, how do you reconcile that with the Earth-centric, human-centric, um, you know, the, the, the that that concept of Islam as 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 uh, apparent as apparently like Earth-centric and terror uh, and human-centric, and how does that work with, you know, the afterlife, the, um, the 
judgment. Um, if humans go extinct and there are other non-human rational life forms, how does that work with uh, the, the day of judgment and the afterlife, do you think? So two, two points to, to answer or to reflect upon your question, not to answer, to reflect. One is that there's no problem in, in humans continuing to evolve. I, again, this is going to take a long, long time and you need mm -hmm. to separate to have isolation and things like that that do not appear uh, to, are going to happen within our conscious lifetime, us or the future generations. Evolution takes a long, long time, okay? So yeah, in principle, it's happening. We see it in front of us with the viruses. That's how your coronavirus is uh, getting all these different mm -hmm. variants. So it does happen. You won't see it at the scale of a human being within our lifetime, conscious lifetime. However, it is happening. And that, to me, has nothing to do with, with the way Islam is or contradicts it. Islam gives me the ethical framework of what to do now. That's it. And if I continue to evolve that, no problem. Or another species or another whole life form comes out, that's fine. That has nothing to do with it. The other point is the I disagree with you about this human-centric, earth-centric. I don't think Islam is human-centric, earth-centric. And that's why in the Quran, it keeps reminding us about human arrogance, thinking that we have to be the center of everything. We have to serve. If we have a brain, we have a lot of work to do. But that doesn't put us in the center uh, that we are the most important. And I think that's where we get what Islam is about wrong. This earth-centric, human-centric, I disagree. I think we are part of the creation. Each part of the creation is a, uh, is a celebration of beauty and diversity and elegance. Um, and it's not about the humans being the center. And I think that's where we get it wrong. And we run into that problem of contradiction. If we remove that egocentric, that human-centric, that other-centric, suddenly everything becomes more clear. So well, it's I mean, it, the framework. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just means it's like, you know, talking about sort of the heavens being created in two days and earth being created in two days um, and uh, judgment and creation of only humans. I mean, in that sense, not that, you know, humans are the, the center of everything, but like as in that this is this earth is god's special creation humans are god's special creation and nothing else um isn't that you know i i like think everything god created is special not not mm -hmm. just humans right and if 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 there was anything special about us it was the extra responsibility so it's not nothing to celebrate in that sense the way we're celebrating it uh, uh, actually, it's a more onus on us to, uh, to explore the world around us and the science around us and other species and to appreciate them and celebrate with them as, as, as each one contributing to the harmony uh, of the universe rather than saying, I'm the center. You know, you, so it, it's what I'm trying to convey is that it's a whole different framework. It's a paradigm shift. It's not a logical, I'm not taking the, the way uh, uh, you're explaining Islam and, and, and building on it. I am removing that framework and substituting a whole different framework. And this is not me, Rana. This is what I believe Islam is, and that's what it was understood in the, in the past. And this is what we want to reclaim. Um, and again, it's like, uh, you know, it's multiple perspectives. And usually with my students, I give them a picture. You, you may have seen it in some of my lectures. I give them a picture of an old young woman, the optical illusion. And I say how... And in half my class, I give them, um, before they see the optical illusion, I, show, I give them uh, a picture of a young woman. And the other half, I give them a picture of an old woman. And I, and I condition them, so to speak, for one minute. And this is from Stephen Convoy's book, uh, Seven Habits of Successful People. I just adapted it to use in my course. So by one minute of conditioning, my students come back to see the optical illusion. They cannot see the, if I gave them the young woman, they cannot see the old woman till after 10 minutes or so. And vice versa, if I gave them the old woman, it takes them 10 minutes to see the young. So similarly, we grow up on a particular understanding of Islam. I grew up the same way. And then when you, you don't see another way to explain the world, and it takes time uh, to, to readjust uh, your perspective, to see from a whole different perspective. And, and that's why we can widen that perspective. We can widen our imagination, see things differently, and uncover a whole new world. Uh, that has no contradiction with Islam. It's by widening how we understand Islam. And that's what I try to do when I encourage uh, reading, when I encourage discussion, 
so that we can try to see each other's perspective. And that's why I, I try to always be humble and listen and say, maybe I'm not seeing something that somebody else is seeing. And I want to learn that. And that's why I like to engage and listen to other conversations. And if I'm not convinced then, or that other person's not convinced, I say, we have to do our homework. To, if we are not satisfied, the onus is on each one of us to go search for more rather than spending time to, do, to convince the other person. I never try to convince anyone, right? If somebody is not convinced, then it's up to them. Either they're comfortable or if not, they have a lot of work to do. Thank and, you, and Doctor. That's how I leave the discussion. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Sohan. Uh, I have a comment from Dr. Uh, Ronald Stockton. The statement that God created the word and then allowed the rules to work themselves out. I hope I captured her point correctly. This sounds very similar to what many of the American founders believed. They were called deists. God exists, but then stepped back and left us in charge. Is this an appropriate comparison? Thanks. Uh, okay, so I'm not an expert on deists or founders, and so I, I and I don't want to say yes because maybe there are other connotations to those uh, terms. I'm always very uh, careful with terminology, uh, and, and so I, I cannot. Um, I'm not going to comment. I can. I said what I said, and that's what I stand by. Now, whatever it looks like, or you want to compare it with something else, that's fine. But I cannot uh, comment because I don't have the knowledge. And I'm always humble to say what I don't know. I don't know. And I'm and I'm going to go look it up now. Thank you, so I can comment on it next time. Thank you, Doctor. We have a question by Hiba, which I'm going to ask in a second. Uh, I want to comment on something that you said in another interview. And by the way, guys. There is tons of interviews for Dr. Uh, Rana Dijani everywhere. And uh, before I ask you actually this question, I wanted to ask you about the New York uh, University of Abu Dhabi uh, conference that you attended. Uh, and they had a symposium on evolution and Islam with a group of scholars. You were one of them. Uh, what was your impression of this uh, symposium? Was it, was it uh, representative of the scientific community? Pretty much I felt that they're trying to push um, different opinions that, but but they ignored that they're not prominent within the scientific community. Um, uh, sorry, but I, I do not recall. Is it NYU Abu Dhabi? Yes. They had a, a evolution or was this American University of Sharqa? Uh, either, either one. I yeah. think you, you attended one with a group of speakers and the, the subject was evolution and Islam or science yeah. and Islam. Yeah, and, yeah, I believe. Yeah, I do not remember. I, I like you said, I've attended so many, so I have to. Like, what year was that? To, to, well, general, to, so I can answer you. Um, sure. Uh, let me ask you a general question. Do you feel yeah. that that these that there is an effort by universities within uh, the, the the Middle East or the Muslim world because Muslimish is focused on the on the Muslim world and and us. Um, uh, do you do you feel that there is a sincere effort in uh, explaining science, or do you feel it's a little bit defensive? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, people are always hesitant from what they don't know. And this is an, a human trait. Let's not just blame Muslims, anyone around the world. If there's something you don't really understand, you're always kind of hesitant, and you'd rather play it safe. Uh, and, and we also know from science that some people are more comfortable with ambiguity, and others need closure. And it's those people who are comfortable with ambiguity who are willing to reach out and don't mind not knowing uh, versus those who like everything has to be very clear. And so from that press, press as a human being, um, many Muslims are like that. So they'd rather avoid it and let's not have any controversy. Um, and hence the defensiveness uh, about this. And again, I want to invoke, I said that there are other agendas uh, that can play out. If I encourage people to question evolution and religion uh, and change frameworks of how we understand Islam, this means we will encourage more freedom of, of speak of speech, uh, more critical, uh, more being more critical of those in power. Uh, it doesn't stop with questioning evolution and questioning religion. It's going to end up also questioning uh, leadership and politics. And some people don't want that. And so they'll stop it at the level of religion and science for fear of where it will go. So again, there are other agendas at play. It's not as uh, simple as, uh, as one uh, as it seems. Uh, and and, and that, that would explain sometimes um, the lack of the discussion uh, and, and, um, uh, and how it is steered away 
and, and how we don't want people to question, let's just stick to what we have. But of course, we will never be able to proceed uh, unless we have open discussions about everything. And evolution right. happens to be one of them. Right. We should not be afraid of the question. Uh, uh, professor, you said in one of the uh, interviews, your interpretation, uh, this uh, verse from the Quran that says that we have created uh, humans with the best of forms, or you have a different translation or interpretation of the word ahsan, uh, which is, uh, what is it? The most fit. The most fit. So uh, that solves a lot of the problems because I think one of the uh, issues and uh, one of the paradigm shifts is that our bodies are uh, not in the best of forms and our environment is not in the best of forms and earth is not in the best of forms and uh, the, the universe is not in the best of forms and our brains and cognition is not in the best of forms. We have over 157 cognitive biases. So we, we're, it's very rarely that we can make any good decision uh, by ourselves. So uh, that's a paradigm shift that seems to sometimes also resist the acceptance of the theory of evolution is the misconception that we are in the best of forms and the supremacy of the, of the human being. Uh, even the concept that we are a successful species in itself is a misconception in science. There are many more species. It's a questionable whether we are even a successful species or not. Um, any comment on that before we go to the question of Hiba? Yeah, so the reason I, I, I only go and talk about that if I'm pushed to talk about it, the reason I don't want to talk about it is because I don't want to use the Quran to explain science because otherwise I'd be falling into the same mistake that others have done before by taking the Quran as a book of science, trying to find evidence in the Quran uh, to, to explain the natural phenomena around us. Uh, because, yeah, today it may work, but tomorrow, if science changes, then my explanation changed. So I wouldn't be doing any good service to Islam by making those interpretations. And that's how that's why I don't do that. Now, when I'm pushed a lot and I say, all right, you keep telling me about al insan, a human is the best. Well, where did you get that? The verse, Ahsani Taqwim. What does Ahsan mean? Again, I go back now to say that the interpretation of the Quran was done by humans. So it has it's not challenging Allah or the Quran or who. It's challenging or not challenging even. It's about questioning with and this is part of what Islam is, those who interpreted before us. They did their best depending on the um the context they lived in, the 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 level of science they knew at that time. But now we have new science. So we can look at things with new knowledge and find a different interpretation. And the ones before us did a great job, and we can do a great job. And somebody is going to come after us and say we were wrong, and they're going to do another job. And that's okay. That's okay. Uh, so in that context, Ahsan in Arabic, and then Arabic is such a rich language. Every term has multiple meanings, depending again on the context. So Ahsan, in this context, I can see it. It means the most fit. Uh, and we use it in our local language, in the colloquial language in Arabic, when we say Ahsan, you know, that's the most fit for you. It doesn't necessarily have to be interpreted that's the best, meaning the pinnacle of, of, of perfection, as you said, because we're not perfect. And that creates a conundrum by itself, right? We're not perfect. But how are we perfect? How does that fit? Well, now it fits because we're not saying we're perfect. We're saying uh, we are the most fit considering the circumstances. The circumstances change, our fitness changes. And so, in that way, we solve that problem of, yes, bacteria is ahsan, we are ahsan, and every organism is ahsan, the most fit for their environment. But again, I, li I do not like to go into those conversations because they may lead in into places um, and, and that, that are not, uh, that may lead to a contradiction later on. But for this particular discussion, we can use it. And I, I want to emphasize one last thing, that by um, the evolution does not question who started the whole world. Even read, I mean, those who contra those who disagree with Darwin, I ask them first thing, have you read Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species? And the 99.9 .9 have not read his book. And they're only quoting what they've heard from somebody on somebody. And if you're a good Muslim, you, you don't do that. You go read the resource. You go read the origin. And then you come and talk. And you do your homework. You should not speak without evidence. 
and yet everybody talks about Darwin without reading his book. And I think that is not right. And that, and, 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 and I remind everybody about that. So if you read the last paragraph of Darwin's book, Origin of Species, he, he talks about the beautiful world of amazing diversity, started from a beginning uh, that he, 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 he assigns a, a power, uh, a God, a power. And, 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 and for, because he was a Christian, it didn't work. So they considered him an atheist. But in his heart, he, he believed there was a power that started it. And then evolution happened, which was the law set forth by that power. We believe that power is Allah. And so by accepting evolution, if you want to use that word, that does not mean you're an atheist you, uh, at all. And that's, the, that's where Christianity considered it an atheism, when we in Islam don't. And so we don't have a problem. We're okay. So let's just open our minds and 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 um, and be accepting uh, as Islam asks us to. There is no space in science for the denial of the theory of evolution. I mean, there are there are uh, other concepts that a person can, uh, you know, uh, deny. that some new uh, controversial theories or concepts, but a, a theory such as evolution, very well established, and uh, most of the natural sciences have been modeled on it, even. Today's even psychology is modeled, you know, on, on evolution. Psychology is modeled on evolution. Uh, it's pretty much, uh, and and you know that that all the uh, uh, fossils, the tremendous amount of fossils all over the world, and and all the discoveries of the various natural sciences have aligned and enforced the theory of evolution. Yes, it has tweaked it many times, and it has changed the timeline and the treeing, which you know, uh, the branching. A lot of uh, 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 anti-evolution scholars they 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 uh, get really excited about uh, those discoveries thinking of them as contradiction but they're just you know tweaking and enhancing uh, of such a, a large theory i will end with this question and maybe uh, two questions uh, doctor in two minutes uh, although you have answered this uh, in a clip from the university of sharjah I, I memorize all your clips now <laughs> how does the story of the creation of adam and the quran not contradict with the theory of evolution? Uh, again, I go back to the framework, right? Uh, first, the Quran is not an expl scientific explanation of, of the world. The Quran is how to live our lives. And therefore, the stories of the different prophets are for us to learn lessons, not to take them technically and say, oh, okay, he was created, um, which exact day, what exact year. No, these are stories to learn from how to live our lives. Okay, so that's it. Now, again, talking about creation, what does the word creation, khalq, back to terminology? Uh, creation could have taken billions of years, millions of years. Why do we have a problem uh, with khalq Adam, creation of Adam, and saying it has to be instantaneous, and therefore this is contradictory to evolution? But when Allah says khalq al-qamar, or khalq al-nujum, nobody says, oh, that has to be instantaneous, and they agree with the theory of physics and gravity and, and Big Bang and 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 the billions of years it took to for it to happen, right? So again, why sometimes we use a term that uh, in a one way, and then we use the same term in a different way? It's okay, fine. You somebody explained it that way, then I can also explain it in a different way because we're humans, and we explain depending on the knowledge we have, uh, and 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 therefore we don't want to be caught up that creation of Adam meant instantaneous. It could have been billions of years talking about evolution from one cell all the way different branches until we have a uh, homo sapiens in the way we have it literally what does that mean was there one person called adam was it a group of people and adam is a representative of it i don't know and frankly it doesn't matter because the quran is not a book of science it's a book to learn from adam's story about how to make decisions how to uh, how to respect others how to learn how to express myself and not about when exactly was he the first or the second, the third, beginning, who comes. And, and one can go into many interpretations of tying it to make it fit evolution. But again, I don't want to get caught into that uh, because somebody else will come with another explanation that's better than mine. And again, back to the framework. It's about how to think, look at nature, observe it, and use Islam and the book of Quran, how to live my life for morals and ethics. Thank you, uh, Doctor. And I remember a saying by a very uh, progressive scholar, uh, name is uh, Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah from uh, Lebanon. 
uh, who said that when science contradicts religion, then religion has to reevaluate its papers. Uh, so uh, we, we, we have the facts from science, and then we can, you know, we can uh, um, un understand that the, the value of, of the guiding value from religion, like the Quran is a book of guidance and it's not a book of science. Uh, there is much symbolism in all the uh, religious books of the past. But I want to add one thing to what you said, or the quote you, from this person, that as scientists, we also have to be skeptical. We, we know today we have, these are the best explanations and they have stood the, the rigor of uh, experiments and other explanations. But we are also humble to know that there may be more, right? And we are always learning and we must always be skeptical as scientists as well. And I always keep that in mind as well, because I don't want to be the arrogant scientist either. That's wrong too. Thank you, Professor. And I want to end with inviting those who want to formulate an opinion about the theory of evolution to either, like Dr. Dijani has proposed, to read and understand it uh, scientifically, which will take some effort. It will not be uh, uh, the path of the lazy. It, you have, it, has, it was going to take some effort to understand it and a, a good reading. Uh, to, for it. And if you are going to take the shortcut of asking someone, then please ask a scientist uh, and a biologist more specifically. Uh, don't ask Dr. Zaghloul al-Najjar, who is a geologist, or don't ask a sheikh who's a theologist. Uh, Dr. Rana Dijani is a biologist, and that's why we're asking her this question. And we invite you to ask her and uh, uh, those who are uh, like her in her position and thank you for all your service uh, professor and all your long path of education i want to end by an invocation uh, let us champion the values of intellectual bravery perpetual curiosity and hunger for truth let us honor scientific thinkers uh, not just in our laboratories but in the practice of nurturing compassionate egalitarian communities that value free inquiry let us work to grow our understanding of the interconnectedness of all life and expand our empathy and reach of our compassion. And let us take daring risks for a freer, fairer, and more joyful world. Thank you, Professor. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you in upcoming episodes of Muslimish Freethinkers. Good night. Thank you for listening to Muslimish Freethinkers. Do let us know what you think of this episode at facebook.com forward slash muslimish. Don't forget to visit us at muslimish.org.